intrusion, which found the marijuana in the car in which he was sitting in the driver's seat. Well, you did get a hearing. He did get a hearing, and that's because the Commonwealth never contested this right. matter. So there are really two issues, right? One is, was the affidavit, you got the hearing, and as you should have, because the affidavit sufficiently met the standard. And the second is, even if it didn't, the fairness of having a decision on appeal that nobody ever argued for uh, prevail. I agree entirely on the first issue. The affidavit here is sufficient. The defendant alleged and asserted in the affidavit that the marijuana was in his possession. The motion stated that the marijuana was taken from the defendant. The well, it, it said it was taken from his person, didn't it? It said from the defendant. It never said person. Didn't say from his person. I agree. It's vague, but... I would, I would, uh, would, you, would you agree that the judge could have said, this is not enough? I, I, and, and had the judge said, this is not enough. You would have provided more, presumably. There would have been an opportunity okay. to provide more. And I do think it's, when you write a, an opinion in this decision, it might be helpful to drop a footnote to remind counsel that this cannot be used as direct evidence against the defendant in the trial. You know, not to say that it couldn't be used for impeachment if the defendant chose to testify, but Sal Bucci and Simmons, these U.S. Supreme Court cases, make it very clear that I think some of the practice here of be making out these vague affidavits is because everyone is concerned that they're going to come back as an admission. They will not do that, is my understanding. But they, will, but they would they, they still be concerned that they could come in if the defendant does testify. And since at this point they don't know if he's going to testify, right. they have to be worried about it. It, it, true, but I just think that there's uh, perhaps an over-concern on that issue. But I, I would, I, I'm sorry, but let me ask you this. Isn't the, if you, if the judge had said that, I take it that the affidavit you might have produced, or your client might have produced, would be one that tied him to the car, right? Yes, I, I think that the affidavit would, would have said that he was, taken from the driver's seat, the exit order ordered him out of the driver's seat, that the, the marijuana was directly next to him in the armrest, which I call the console because the, the testimony is that it was the armrest between the two, oh, dot, 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 inaudible. It's clearly what they're talking about. The center console here is what they're talking about. It was taken out of, it was inside the armrest, it was clearly concealed, being inside the armrest, the, this, this could have been specifically articulated, and I submit would have satisfied. Well, is, would it would it have? You, it would have satisfied your obligations under Rule 13. Would have said yes. Would have satisfied his obligation to be specific. And to be specific, well, and and to assert possession. The important thing here is that even with the affidavit as it stands, the defendant in the affidavit asserted possession of the contraband. These okay, but I, I have a question on that. And the closest cases, or the most helpful cases I could find were Carmel versus King and Carmel versus Pogorski. So your argument is that um, the defendant, by being in the car, has sufficient expectation of privacy in the console as a closed part of the car to raise this issue. because. That, yes. That's your argument, and he doesn't have to prove that he owned the car, no, or that he was Pogorsky. the driver. Exactly. Pogor Pogorsky yeah, right. Pogorski and is very those, clear but they they don't come out and say it. Um, they don't actually say what you what they you need them to say, to but they yeah. suggest it. And anyway, would, he it, he was in the driver's seat, so right. But there's the no evidence. But the, but the, I think the ju judge's finding mm -hmm. somebody somebody. Oh, uh, I know. But there was no evidence he was driving. There was no evidence the car was on. In fact, the clear inference is the car wasn't on. So he uh, wasn't driving, he was in the driver's seat. Uh, and I've been careful to state that. And right. I, I yeah. acknowledge that on that issue, the Commonwealth's federal cases are very good for the Commonwealth. Believe me, I was <clears throat> rather back on my heel when I got their brief. But, but they're all federal cases. But they're all federal right. cases. Right. And I would invite this court, as you've done many times before, to use Article 14 if, if it is necessary to establish a greater privacy right in the car 
Pogorski comes so close to using Article 14, but they don't because they, uh, just, uh, Chief Justice Liakos very slyly worked around the Rakes case and said that it established that ownership didn't, wasn't the dispositive issue. They said, therefore, the occupants of the van had the privacy right. We don't know what the uh, affidavit asserted in that case. That's one thing that's missing from that case. However, as to the substantive establishment of the expectation of privacy, I believe this case is governed by Pogorski and that the, it, it goes further. He's in the driver's seat. He has control of the car. He, well, well, we well, don't know that standing. because he's the, there's no, nothing to say that the key is in the ignition. There's no yeah. evidence about that. Well, so, I, I agree. But so we don't know he has oh, okay. control. It, I, it, I won't push it that far. Yeah. It, it, the Pogorski gives him standing, but does it really address the question of the reasonable expectation of privacy? Specifically. Yes, it does, Your Honor. Uh, it, it, remember, that was back when that whole business of standing versus expectation of privacy and, and whether there was going to be the automatic standing, that was in dispute at the time. The Pogorski case is decided on the basis of the expectation, legitimate expectation of privacy. Yes, it says we must determine, well, I'm reading from Pogorski, we must determine whether the defendant's expectation of privacy in the interior of a windowless van, blah, 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 is one which society would recognize as reasonable. Exactly. So your position is that uh, the defendant asserted this expectation of privacy in the affidavit? By asserting possession of the drugs, in the, uh, of the drugs, period, in his possession. This is where the Taylor case, which is cited in Rodriguez, the next case up. So okay. are there some unspoken words? Yes. Did, by saying, I possess the drugs, and without saying, and I had an expectation of privacy, I, 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 we have to read those words in? No. no, those words get read in only after the Commonwealth does not contest the issue. It's enough to make his threshold showing. Is my, this is my argument. The affidavit makes the threshold showing, establishes the fact of the possession, which if the Commonwealth does not come back with evidence to rebut that, to meet that, does not allow that that, the, that, that affidavit assertion must be taken as true. And I say at that point, you can say possession equals expectation of privacy because it's not been shown to be in plain view. He hasn't abandoned it. We're not talking about common areas. One in interesting aspect to the federal cases as well are, are that all of those cases involve secret compartments in the back, which if you want to talk about the premises cases, which I think are a little attenuated here, but... Those are about common areas, that there is no expectation of privacy in the common area. In the Lockin case, for example, the driver slash not owner of that case did not have an expectation of privacy in the secret compartment. I would say that's like a common area. It's not like the console next to the driver. I think that's a... So are, are you saying, though, to boil it down, that the defendant does not have to use the phrase expectation of privacy? doesn't have to use magic words, Your Honor. Okay. No. no, no, no. So, so, so how, does it, uh, how, how does it work? Where, where you have um, asserted possession and reasonable expectation of privacy essentially are read into it, um, and the Commonwealth doesn't challenge it, is it, uh, is it not a live issue? I think it's it, the only thing I would disagree with. Assertion of possession then Commonwealth doesn't contest it. It is not a live well, issue. Well, the judge. The judge could raise it oh, to a sponte. Absolutely, yeah. of course. But, but you know, the Commonwealth, by not contesting it, it ceases to be a live issue. You take that assertion in the affidavit as establishing as a prima facie fact that must be taken as true that this possession is imbued with the expectation of privacy. But let me give you another way of looking at it, though that the affidavit gets you to a hearing if the Commonwealth doesn't contest it. Exactly. I mean, anyway, gets you to a hearing. But you always have the burden of oh, proof I, on I, this question, and the affidavit isn't evidence. I, of and course not. And so that, that put aside that no one raised it, but wouldn't, I mean, isn't there an argument that what should happen is that 
Well, I guess you would, I mean, what happens if nobody raises it? How, how do you get from having the burden of proof, not putting any evidence in at the hearing, and the affidavit isn't, how, how do you satisfy your burden of proof? The burden of proof is essentially satisfied because burden of, burdens regard issues at play. No. To, and, but but to, to, to the extent Aren't you that really saying that it's a stipulated, it becomes a stipulated fact? It becomes a prima facie fact, I would say. And that's but the, based that, on what evidence? On, on, based on the assertion under oath in the affidavit. Well, but that can no, be no, dangerous in other situations. You can't do that because that could be dangerous on other but, but situations. But I mean, suppose at a trial, um, the colonel doesn't put in evidence on an issue. Are you going to say then that the defendant is stipulated to that issue? It's the same way as a commonwealth has the burden to prove criminal responsibility when the defendant raises that, for example. Uh, the, 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 the point here is that, and this isn't unusual, just last month in your uh, case, Shawsey, had to do with- Yeah, yeah but that's, a, uh, the insan insanity is an affirmative defense. I, I know, Your Honor, but I'm just saying the, the burden of production, I, I submit this is, it, this is the, the point. The Commonwealth, no, the defendant has the burden of producing sufficient evidence to get to the hearing. At that time, if the Commonwealth does not make it into an issue, does not put the issue at play, does not put, say, oh, the possession assertion, it was on the seat next the, to him. There's a, there's a presumption of sanity. And, and in order to put the issue of the defendant's competence or, or, or you know, mental competence in, in play, the defendant has to produce some evidence that he was insane. Here, there is no evidence that the defendant had a reasonable expectation of privacy. Uh, absolutely, there is no evidence, but following. So, so how, does the, how does the issue get into play? It gets into play, at least according to Lefebvre, it gets into play that the Commonwealth goes forward, and depending on the evidence of the Commonwealth, if, the, if, it, if it then becomes an issue, the defendant can then rebut. I mean, it's, it sounds a bit odd. Well, are, 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 you really, are you really suggesting there was no evidence of a reasonable expectation of privacy at this hearing? Well, I, I believe that there was evidence. Right. Wasn't there sufficient evidence from which the judge could have concluded that the could have made a marijuana or the drug finding? Uh, yes. Now, now I would. Yeah, I think that just by the positional relationship between the defendant and the drugs, the defendant being in the driver's seat, I think it's sufficient. In any event, if you have to get to that point, I would urge you not to follow Lockin in the, in the federal uh, uh, jurisprudence, but to, to follow Pogursky and expand Article 14 if necessary to cover that. So, so, so once the police officer testifies that the defendant was inside a car, taken out. he was taken out and, and I looked in there and I found drugs inside the car, th that is essentially that's, that establishes the reasonable expectation of privacy. That does. Your evidence. If the Commonwealth, however, says, and um, I, well, let's say, looked in the glove compartment and found out that the car was rented and the defendant's name wasn't on the rental application. Hmm. I think maybe the defendant might have some problems there. And Andy was sitting in the back seat. Yeah, or, or that, too. You know, uh, there are any number of ways that the Commonwealth can put the issue at play, they, which they, as I say, didn't do. But, but, but you're saying, I take it, that um, the defendant didn't have to get up and testify in this Absolutely case because not. it was already in the Commonwealth's prima facie case. Right. Y yes, yes. The defendant doesn't have to testify, but you can take the affidavit assertion as, as meeting the threshold burden of production the threshold burden of production only to say that if he doesn't say it, the drugs are in my possession, then you could say you're not alleging a possessory um, crime. You, 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 you don't have anything to go on there. That, that's a dangerous thing, though, I think. because Well, only because when, when one thinks of burden of production, one thinks of what's happening at the hearing. What you're saying is it gets you, you've got enough to get you to a hearing. And, and, and what I'm saying here, it, it only follows the reasoning of Rodriguez coming up next in its interpretation of Commonwealth versus Taylor, which talks in these terms, prima facie evidence and burdens of production, not exactly the same, but here you have a search warrant case, no, a search warrant case. Yeah, no, there's warrant. no warrant here. So no, the fact no, that I'm there's sorry. no warrant yeah. already and the judge says there's a sufficient amount for a hearing, the burden is on the Commonwealth 
to present some evidence of the circumstances of the search. Isn't that correct? Yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, then it's also your burden in that, that context to establish a reasonable expectation of privacy. Yes, yes. Which you can meet through the Commonwealth's evidence. Right. Right, right, absolutely, absolutely. And I'll rest on my brief as to the argument number one. If there are no questions. Thank you, Mr. McLaughlin. Good morning, Ms. Celia. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the Court. Kathleen Celio on behalf of the Commonwealth. I ask this Court to affirm the motion judge's denial. Um, I have a question, Ms. Celio. The defendant is charged with possession here. Is that my correct? That is correct. So your whole case is that he possessed the marijuana that was in the console. Why do you then need the affidavit to do more than that? I mean, that is your case. If he didn't possess that marijuana in that console, there is no case for the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth did not contest um, the defendant getting a hearing. Uh, it, based on the defendant's affidavit, I would disagree with uh, my brother in the way that he's interpreted it, but he says that they found this in his possession. So based on these facts... But if they didn't find it in his possession, you've got no case. No, so no, so that, what, what are you surprised by? What is the harm to the Commonwealth from this affidavit? Well, no, I don't think that it is not um, my argument here that the defendant did, wasn't entitled to a hearing, especially where the Commonwealth didn't contest it. What I, what the, it's the Commonwealth's um, argument is that the defendant has to produce evidence at the hearing in order to establish he has an expectation of privacy. Yeah, but you did, it, you did it for him. Yeah. Yes, you can do it that way. That's what Lefebvre says. That's what a whole bunch of cases oh. to say. The defendant can put the police on the stand and, uh, I mean, you know, the, or the Commonwealth. Oh, yes. The, the, oh, the correct. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that the defendant needs to produce witnesses. What I'm saying is that through cross-examination or through the Commonwealth's witnesses, he can establish that he has an expectation of privacy in the car. But I don't think that just sitting in a car that's parked gives him that. That's a different issue. That's a, well, that's, oh, that's okay, a well, what about, what about in Commonwealth versus King? In that case, the defendant, um, there was possession there. He had a, the, the passenger had a reasonable expectation of privacy in closed compartments in the car. Why wouldn't this defendant here? He's sitting in the driver's seat. I grant you he wasn't driving. But if the passenger had a reasonable expectation of privacy in King, why wouldn't the driver here? Because I think that in, in looking, this is a car that's parked. There's no evidence that he's entitled to be in that car. This, I mean, the wait, police wait, report wait. indicates this is a rental car. So, so what? I mean, all of us drive rental cars, leased cars. I mean, I don't know what the percentage. Lots of people drive rental cars. So he's in there. He's in the driver's seat. He's got the marijuana in the console next to him. But there's no, there no evidence that he had a right to be in that car. Okay, but, but, I mean, you, but it, is, it your position, is it your position that the police, with absolutely no basis, just randomly, could have entered this car and searched it? Yes. What? Right, so the police, the, the police can just basically walk down the street and search cars I, based I, on no predication? I would... Because there's no reasonable expectation of privacy in the car. I would think that the... Police would not do that I'm because. I'm asking what the police could or should do. Right. I'm saying, right. are the police entitled because there's no reasonable expectation of privacy and therefore it's not a search? In this particular Dodge Charger? No, no, no. No, in general. Just in general, answer, can the police basically question. walk into a car without any predication at all because there's no reasonable expectation of privacy in the car and therefore it's not a search? No, in general, I, I don't think that. Not in general, there, if, specifically. In other words, we've had all kinds, you know, the court's been divided, but, you know, you can take your sniffer dogs and walk them up and down the street, right? Remember that? Yeah, correct. And Justice Gantz is saying, can the police just open up, you know, my suitcase comes through, you know, Logan Airport. I've got a lock on it. It has TSA, they've opened it, okay, because there's a very clear undertaking that they've got a right to do that for all kinds of reasons. He's saying, can they just walk along and open up a car door? Not a car that a defendant is an owner of the car or has no, the no, right no, to be in that, that car. They don't so, know that. Okay, so, so if the car is empty or the car has somebody sitting there, that they could just walk in with no predication at all and do a search? I, I, I mean, the police could go in there, and then I think the question is afterwards whether or not the defendant has a privacy interest wait, in that wait, car. What, that would what tells you that the police can just walk into it, can just open the car door? Excuse me? What tells you, tells me, that the police can go down the street and just open a car door? I, it, it becomes then afterwards whether or not the 
defendant has a privacy interest in the car. I, I mean, I don't think that the police, in a practical manner, is going to go up to cars because they care about the okay. items but the, but being suppressed. But the point suppressed. of the matter is that if there's no real expectation of privacy, it's not constitutionally a search, which means the police can treat it like it's garbage. Correct. They can go yes. into any car and search it and then maybe take their chances that somebody is going to say that they're going to have, but I mean, I mean, aren't you confusing standing for reasonable expectation of privacy? I mean, it seems that there has to be a reasonable expectation of privacy in the car, otherwise the police can randomly search cars. No, that I, I that it, that's not what um, I'm proposing that this court find. What I'm proposing is, is that the defendant needs there, there needs to be something in the hearing getting to the hearing at this point that shows that the defendant has a privacy interest but you're, you're, but you're charging him with possession of things in that car and under amendola is that not sufficient to say that somebody has a reasonable expectation of privacy in the car and he has standing to invoke that reasonable expectation because you're saying he possessed something in the car. Isn't that what our jurisprudence is? The two things. One, under Commonwealth versus Carter, this court has held that standing and, and the defendant's right. burden of proving a privacy interest are separate. Right. Are separate. Right. And I think that this court has then in Commonwealth versus Frazier, after common, um, Amendola 410 Mass, this court held that a co-defendant um, who uh, can share a privacy interest in a place that is searched uh, if the other defendant or co-felon has privacy interest in the area. But if no one has a privacy interest in an area, the defendant can't, or if that the person is not a co-felon, um, what this court has held in target standing, the defendant can't, ass can't assert a third person's privacy interest. Can I ask you this, just off that? What about the fairness of this? I mean, the appeals court in other cases has said nobody contested whether there's a privacy interest and we're not going to either. So if, if I understand this, this case um, correctly, Commonwealth didn't raise it, judge didn't raise it, cases decided, nobody argued it on appeal, right? No one argued it at the motion hearing. Nobody argued yeah. it at the motion yeah. hearing. And it then, was argued on appeal? It was brought up on appeal. By whom? The judge. The, the, it was the, not argued. The, 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 the appeals it court. It was not up. argued on appeal. It, it wasn't in your brief, was it? No, it wasn't. Okay. Was so it the in the appeal, defendant's so brief? No. It wasn't no, argued. No. So the appeals court says, oh, they never showed. I mean, how does that fit with, how is that fair? Well, this court has held that a reviewing court can affirm a denial of a motion to suppress on any grounds. And that. Here, there were the defendant, and it's the defendant's burden. This, this court had held that in Commonwealth versus Netto also, that when there's any ambiguity, it is the <coughs> defendant's burden to show that he has a privacy interest. Just like in Netto when well, it, it would seem, uh, it just seems to me that there's a, that there's a, at least a, a, a glimmer that you're, tra you're charging him with a possessory crime. He's in the driver's seat. No, it's not uh, running. He's in the driver's seat. He's sitting next to the console in which the marijuana is found. That there's a fair assumption that everybody at the trial level thought there was an expectation of privacy. So it just seems to me. I, I, I think that it is the defendant's burden, as this, this court w was asking my brother. I mean, when the Commonwealth, the, it's the Commonwealth's burden to prove all elements of a crime. And even, cri uh, even elements that the defendant does not contest. The, it is still the Commonwealth burden, and, and this court. So why shouldn't we just cut through all of this and to say, yes, he did, based on this liquid, he did show an expectation of privacy. You're sitting in a car. There's no, there's no claim. There's no claim that he had no right to be in the car. He's sitting in the car. I don't care. Frankly, I don't care if it's lent, at least owned, or anything else, because. Um, you know, that doesn't tell me anything about how cars get on the road. He's sitting there, the, you know, there doesn't seem to be any question as to where the marijuana is. Why wouldn't he have a right of privacy? Because I think that if you look at the expectation of privacy jurisprudence of this court, that it's required well, not more this than court. sitting so in the house. How do you deal, as Justice Cowan said, with both um, King and uh, <coughs> Podgorski? Well, it, it, actually, if you look at Podgorski, which is in 1980, so it was um, before this court um, adopted the automatic standing 
rule, but if you look at it, it is the defendant was a co-felon. And the, the reasoning of the court was is that the other co-felon, who was the owner of the car, had a privacy interest in the car. Mr. And so what, this court- What's your best case? Not, not the First Circuit. What's your best Massachusetts case? Well, there, this court has actually not analyzed uh, defendants in, in the context of looking at factors of a privacy King interest. King did somewhat, and it came, I, it came, King came after Pagoras, but not much. And, and that was a passenger. And the uh, a passenger um, defendant has standing if he, as an occupant of the station wagon, had a legitimate expectation of privacy, and um, they held that he did, that for places that include at least the closed compartments, which this is. But, um, uh, but, but I have one other question for you. Yes. Um, excuse me if I can just, just finish. Um, what, in this case, the police arrested the defendant or they didn't arrest him? They arrested him. They arrested him, okay. Yeah. They arrested him. On what basis do they go, on, in your argument, on what basis do they get into the car to conduct a search? It, it was based on the, the call of a firearm transaction. And so it was, a, it was a fear for safety that there was firearms inside the car. So and that's so your basis, was, safety. Yeah, it, it was a Once protect- he's arrested, you still don't want to have a firearm in the car. Okay. Yeah, right. so that's okay. how they got in. I mean, it, it's under the premise that there was, that based on the call and the corroboration. That argued at the motion hearing? Was yes. That, okay. W- was All that right. an anonymous caller? It was. Yes. It was. Aren't you saying, it, if, no. I, if I understand you, that the defendant did not invoke the expectation of privacy, didn't use the words expectation of privacy? And your brother says, I didn't use the magic phrase, but by virtue of acknowledging that it was the drugs were in my possession, that invoked the expectation of privacy. Isn't that what you're saying? He didn't use the the buzzwords, expectation of privacy. What I'm saying is that the the evidence that it was his burden at, at the hearing to produce evidence that he had a privacy interest, and he didn't do that. Can I ask you a question about the 911 yeah. call? I, I, I take it from that the call was not introduced into the record? It was not, Your Honor. Nor was the operator called to testify about the call. How, how did evidence of the call get into the record? The, the evidence of the call was two police officers testified. The dispatch call that was, that was relayed to the officers was introduced um, at trial. It was played. And that was, it was reconstructed. It was inaudible, but it was reconstructed on page 11. Of Isn't it known by now that you have to put in some evidence of the basis of reliability and the knowledge to get this call in? That would have strengthened the Commonwealth's case immensely, but I don't think it was necessary. <laughs> I, so. I, I don't think it was necessary because what I mean, it wasn't what? necessary. No, I, I, I'm saying looking at, that was, that, that, that would have strengthened the case. But what I'm saying is looking at... I thought what it would strengthen the case. It was the necessary prerequisite to get it in. No, because this court has held even anonymous calls can be corroborated in order to be... By non-innocuous details. And there was nothing here that was non-innocuous detail. Like, I mean, anybody who had a grudge against the guys in that car could have called up and said, there's this car with Georgia plates and here are the plates and blah, 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 blah. They're doing anything in that car. Correct. But I think that what we had, and if you look at the, the court in Lyons, which this case is similar to Lyons, but, I, but what the court and where the court held it wasn't enough, but what they said is there was no other suspicious behavior. And I think that it is probative that when the police arrive and that they go past the Dodge Charger, the person who was allegedly involved in the transaction briskly walked away. And, I, and then this was also an you area You don't know where that that was a person that was allegedly. All you know is a third person was outside and walked away. Well, this hey. corroborated hey. because what the, t- the, the, the call was that two people inside the car and another one leaning in were engaged in the transaction. And so upon police arrival, that the other person walked away. And I think that that corroborated that that person was involved with the transaction. And this also was an area where shots had been fired the night before. And so it also corroborates that this was an area of violence, and that this could be a place where firearms were transacted. Ms. Celia, if yes, we disagree with the appeals court, uh, once they get past the, the, you know, the affidavit, and they say um, the, the, the judge's factual finding established that the police did not seize the challenge evidence from the defendant's person, that's mm-hmm. correct, and then, but from a motor vehicle, that's correct, in which the defendant neither asserted, let's give them that, 
nor established an expectation of privacy. If we take the facts that were established, you're saying we should just find that there's no expectation of privacy without giving me any real Massachusetts authority. I, th I think that there, the defendant didn't establish enough facts to... Um, but I'm just saying take the facts. Yeah. Sitting in the driver seat, console, he had access to it. And you're saying no expectation of privacy because? Because I think that this court is required, like someone sitting inside of a house that he has no pri that they have no privacy interest in, and um, and contraband's found there. That there, there must be so, some sort of ownership or a right to be there. And I think aren't you sort of asking us to infer that it was a stolen car? No, because I think because that otherwise he has a right to be in it. I mean, if it, if he didn't steal it. No, that's not true because it's it, it, it could be a rental car in which the rental time expired, um, and he had no right to be there, or that someone else's car. Wait, I well, mean, well. You mean if I if if I have a rental car and it's due back earlier, but I have it, I don't have any reasonable. Ex I've now forfeited any reasonable expectation of anything that I may have stored in that car driving back to the rental agency because it's overdue. Correct. I mean, I think that's consistent with the court's jurisprudence, also in hotels, as in Netto. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Your Honors.